Okay, great. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the LSE for this evening's event. My name is Christopher Polk, and I'm a professor of finance and director of the Financial Markets Group at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Tonight, I'm extremely pleased to welcome Professor Robert Schiller from Yale University to the LSE. Professor Schiller has made such a dramatic impact on how we, academics, practitioners, policymakers, ordinary investors, uh, think about markets, and thus it is a real honor to have him at an FMG event. In 2013, Professor Schiller, with Professors Eugene Fama and Lars Hansen from the University of Chicago, won the Nobel Prize for their empirical, empirical analysis of asset prices. Let me give you some background. Work by Fama in the 1970s argued that short-run returns were mainly unpredictable, which is consistent with a market that incorporates information efficiently. However, in 1981, Professor Schiller published a seminal piece entitled, Do Stock Prices Move Too Much to Be Justified by Subsequent Changes in Dividends? The answer there and in subsequent work by Professor Schiller was a resounding, yes, they do. This finding suggested that although prices respond quickly to information, they also change for other reasons as well. Schiller interpreted this excess volatility as resulting from investor sentiment. This fact deepened our understanding of financial markets, and his heterodox view helped kickstart the field of behavioral finance. In March 2000, Professor Schiller published the first edition of Irrational Exuberance, which was based in large part on the aforementioned academic work. That book warned that the long-running bull market of the 90s was a bubble, and that stock prices were being driven by human psychology, not by real values. Weeks later, the market began to drop, declining nearly 40% over the next two years. Fast forward a few years later to 2005, and Professor Schiller released the second edition of the same book, this time arguing that the housing market was the latest and greatest bubble. We all know how that prediction played out. We are here tonight to celebrate the publication of the third edition <laughs> of Irrational Exuberance. Given this great man's track record with this book, I suggest you listen very carefully. <laughs> Before we begin, Dallas is excited to only have you here, but also engage with you on social media during and afterwards. The Twitter hashtag is hashtag LSE Schiller, and as long as there are no technical difficulties, recording of the event will be made available as a podcast on our website. Though we're happy for you to tweet your reaction in real time, please do put your phones on silent so as not to disrupt the event. As usual, after an LSE public event, uh, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to Professor Schiller. And as a special treat tonight, there will also be a book signing taking place following the event with copies of Irrational Exuberance on sale outside the venue. Will you please join me in welcoming Professor Schiller to LSE to deliver his lecture entitled, Irrational Exuberance as Relevant as Ever. Well, thank you. I didn't actually write that title, but that's a good title, I thought. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you're right. I, uh, thank you. Last time I spoke here at LSD was about another book of mine, uh, probably on a similar topic, but uh, uh, this is, as you say, I'm going to talk about uh, the third edition of my book. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it is true. The, f the first edition was just about the stock market. Then, that was in 2000. Then I decided, because of the real estate bubble, I needed to add the real estate market. So that's the second edition, which you see there, in 2005. Now the third edition, I've added a third chapter <laughs> about the bond market, which uh, seems to, a lot of people talk about a bond market bubble. But I, I'm not as alarmist uh, as I was in the other two editions. Uh, because the bond market is often tamer than these other markets. And anyway, I don't want to try my luck at forecasting a crisis <laughs> again. Um, so, uh, so this is, uh, I just want to start out with this, talking about the stock. I'm going to talk about all three markets, the stock market, bond market, uh, and housing market. Uh, all of which, by the way, are booming in the UK today, <laughs> and in the United States, and in many other places. This is the USA. Uh, and this is my plot showing the blue line is the real stock market, 
from 1871 until the present. And you can see that's the first edition. That's the second. Well, actually, the second edition was here. <laughs> and now we're here. Just looking at this picture, though, gives, you, it gives me some uh, agitas because uh, these things look awfully um, boomy and busty, don't they? Uh, this is the green line is earnings per share accruing to the index. And you see the earnings did something similar. Not as so some people would say, well, maybe this is all justified because the earnings uh, showed a similar pattern. But I think that it's not quite so simple because the earnings respond to the same things that are driving stock prices. So they're not exogenous. Uh, the theory that I developed in the book is primarily one about feedback and pre well, precipitating factors and feedback. This is very different from the efficient markets theory. I'm going to talk about my theory first, and then I'll come back to Eugene Fama's theory, <laughs> my, my co Nobel Prize winner, who uh, we don't always see eye to eye. <laughs> uh, but uh, now this is not necessarily a description of prices, but the underlying factor that's driving prices, because there's also smart money trying to predict these factors. And so day to day, bubbles don't look uh, smooth at all. But the basic idea is that speculative bubbles, uh, like those I just showed you, are driven by, uh, they're started by a confluence of precipitating factors. The idea is, it's history we're talking about. Anything that happens in history doesn't have a simple explanation. So if you ask, why did we have World War II? Well, what do historians do? They'll give you a list of things. It was a bunch of factors. Some of them were working against having a war, but everything, the, the balance tipped in, in, in favor of the bad ones, and we had this event. So that's what I, I think it's unfortunate. In trying to understand the history of the market, you've got to look at lists of factors. But on top of that, there's a second, and, the, and there are also naive theories. For example, the price of land always goes up, uh, especially in places like London, where land is scarce. And this is not an economist theory. This is naive theory. Uh, <laughs> the, just, because, <laughs> just because land is scarce in London doesn't mean the price will always go up. I don't have to tell you that, right? But that's out there. That's a theory. It's like a thought virus. That, um, and so what happens, the theory that I talk about in the book is that when prices start going up, it encourages communications about stories and theories that support the idea that this prices should be going up. So when price starts going up, uh, that's price to price feedback. People see prices going up. They start talking. They hear other people are um, doing well, and it gets them excited. And they repeat stories like, there's only so much land, <laughs> and so <laughs> the population is growing. The price always has to go up. Um, there's also other kinds of feedback. A price to GDP to price feedback is a different form that the general public doesn't understand. When stock prices start going up, there's a wealth effect. People start spending more, so the economy gets more prosperous. And then they, people say, well, look, I, we were right. The market predicted this. And so they go back and buy more. Then there's price to corporate earnings to price feedback. So if the price, stock market starts going up, because of one of these precipitating factors, then uh, people spend more. Now, corporate earnings are a residual after cost, so it doesn't take a big percentage increase in sales to cause a bigger increase in corporate earnings. So then the market, people look at price earnings ratios mechanically, some of them do, and they see higher earnings and they think we're a new era. They, they justify some kind of story about. Uh, about why it was uh, corporate earnings are going up now at this point of history. And we have professional news media whose job is to generate stories <laughs> that are attractive and interesting. And a story is especially interesting if it explains the price increases you see. So I, I call these bubbles naturally occurring Ponzi schemes. Uh, in, in the US, we call it a Ponzi scheme because Charles Ponzi did a fraudulent scheme to make a lot of money fa until he ended up in jail in the 1920s. But there are other names for it. But they don't even have to be fraudulent. It's just a story develops, and then it generates uh, feedback and price increases. Um, 
One thing is important, it's not just that people extrapolate price increases, it's not quite like that. People see prices going up and it reminds them that they always go up or <laughs> something simple like that or that stocks are the best investment. The more prices go up, the more they're reminded of that story and the more they hear other people saying it so they think it must be true. Uh, so that's the basic theory in the book. Uh, and I wanted to start by, since the feedback might be the most controversial part of it, I wanted to start by showing my own evidence of feedback that I've derived by surveying. I've been doing questionnaire surveys since uh, 1987, but I started doing them regularly uh, in, uh, well, th this question starts in 1996. So uh, I did a, um, a questionnaire survey of U.S. high-income individuals and I sent out questionnaires and one of the questions was, uh, do you agree with the following statements? Stocks are the best investment for long-term holders who can buy and hold through the ups and downs of the market. Now, where did I get that? I was picking up my mail one morning and it was printed on an envelope that came to me <laughs> and then I started seeing it, every, that was in the mid-1990s, I saw, started seeing it everywhere. I, my friend Jeremy Siegel at the Wharton School wrote a book about this called Stocks for the Long Run. Uh, that stocks always, uh, always outperform other investments. And I thought, well, why is everybody saying this now, right when the market is soaring? Uh, I thought there was a connection. It wasn't the eternal truth of that statement. It was the market's going up now. So uh, I started in 1990. I wish I could have started earlier asking this question. You don't even know what the thought viruses are until after they're uh, fairly well established. So, th so th this is agreement with that question. These are just high-income Americans. We had over 95% agreement. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, the, question, the question was strongly agree, agree, agree somewhat, neutral, disagree, disagree somewhat, strongly dis And I put all the agrees together and it, it was like 97% agreement. And that was, by the way, I'm showing the stock price. That was when the market reached a peak. They peaked together. And it wasn't a question about this year or next year. The, the confidence survey, people like to assume that people have these time horizons of six months or a year. I didn't say anything about six months or a year. I just said the best investment, like always. And somehow they, th there were a lot of people throwing this at them because it was profitable to do so to sellers of uh, mutual funds. But then the market crashed and so did the agreement with that. Uh, and now I've carried this forward. Now it's not a perfect fit, but you see a correlation between the level of the stock market and the agreement with that. So that's feedback. There, there. So uh, maybe I'll move on. This is another question. I had uh, now one reason why people invest in the stock market is they have the idea that well it might fall, but it will surely be back up. They, I know that people said in the great roaring twenties the typical statement was. One step down, two steps up, one step down, two steps up. That's how the market goes. So what do they think? So the question was, um, if the stock market were to drop heavily tomorrow, what would you do? What do you think it will do the next day? Go up, go down, uh, or stay the same? And this is the percent who agreed that it would go up, back up. And this also tracks the stock price. So that means people have a stronger sense of resilience of the market. That I don't have to worry when it's going up. And that's feedback. So the idea is that that's what forces the market to do these big gyrations that we see uh, in reaction to something uh, hard to see. Now this just is a, uh, uh, another question I have. Do you think the stock market is overpriced, underpriced, or about right? These are again U.S. investors. But I have here both individual and institutional investors. And we can see that from 19, uh, it, uh, the early 1990s until 2000, confidence in the valuation of the market dropped dramatically uh, so that only 30% thought that it was not overpriced. This is valuation confidence. This is the percent who think that it's not overpriced. So only 70% of the U.S. population thought the stock market was overpriced. Why did they do that? I don't know. Why, why did they continue to buy it if they thought it was overpriced? It must be that they didn't put two and two together the way you and I might. And they just thought it's market is a great investment, it's the best investment, so I'll do that. Now in, uh, it ends in 2014, but it's down a little bit more. Uh, 
for individual, for especially for institutional. So now we're getting scary again in that people think the market is overpriced. Um, so I think that uh, let me now I wanted to talk about what a lot of people have been trained in, which is efficient markets theory. Uh, the idea has been efficient markets are priced optimally given available information. Now I like to always look at the history of thought of ideas, and I think the core idea which underlies this is the idea of a conditional distribution and a conditional expectation. So that uh, you know the typical finance, well the simplest finance theory would say the stock price is the mathematical expectation conditional on information at time today on, on the, its price tomorrow. Or, uh, or it's the conditional expectation of the present value of earnings or something like that. But the real core idea was just the idea of a conditional expectation. <coughs> you know how to do it. If you have a multivariate distribution, x very, uh, f of x, y, z, you know how to compute the conditional distribution, conditional on that one value of y. Well, it turns out that that concept uh, was hardly known at all. This is n-grams count of frequency in books. From 1700 until around 1950, nobody seemed to mention that, and then it exploded. So I think there was a after 1950, and this kind of matches the uh, efficient markets re uh, re revolution, as I'll show in a minute. Markov process is another uh, theory, uh, another mathematical concept related that uh, didn't develop until 1960. So something was fermenting and changing in the way people are thinking. The whole theme of my book is largely that the stock market is driven by changes in the way people are thinking, not by fundamental, not, uh, not as much by fundamentals as you think. Uh, the idea that stock markets are efficient goes way back, but it not with those terms and not with any clarity about conditional expectations. This is uh, from a book by George Gibson in 1889, The Stock Markets of London, Paris, and New York. And he says essentially that markets are efficient. When shares become publicly known in an open market, the value which they acquire <coughs> may be regarded as the judgment of the best intelligence concerning them. This was a theory already enunciated, but it didn't catch on uh, widely. He also says in this book a remarkable thing, something like this. I don't have the exact quote. In this modern electronic age, information flows at the speed of electricity. And my first thought was, what is he talking about? That's 1889. <laughs> <laughs> but now when I think twice, yes, it did. They had the telegraph, and so it was. From London to New York, it could, they had the transatlantic cable. <laughs> uh, but the real thing came with uh, the idea of efficient markets. And here is uh, uh, <coughs> the word efficient markets developed uh, around 1960, late 60s. You can see nobody ever said efficient markets, but then the idea exploded like an epidemic, a, 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 thought, a vir thought virus epidemic. There was an earlier concept of perfect markets. I did an n-gram search of that, too. And you can see it was coming up earlier in the, earlier in the 20th century. But perfect markets is different. Here's a statement of what I call perfect markets by Charles Conant, writing in August of 1901, over 100 years ago. Uh, and what he says is that when you have perfect markets, Prices are right, and goods and capital move from place to place under the influence of the law of the greatest good to the community with the least waste of energy, the smallest misdirection of effort. And then he has this thing, in the present state of knowledge. So he has a little bit of conditional expectations, but not, uh, not a lot. Now here's an n-grams count, again, of the frequency of efficient markets. I already showed you the efficient markets in books. I have it from 1800 to 2008. And here's this other thing coming up here, <laughs> behavioral finance. It's a counter-revolution that started, I would say, in the 1990s. <coughs> Dick Thaler and I have been organizing seminars on behavioral finance in, in, at the National Bureau of Economic <laughs> Research since 1991. So that's when we started our seminar, right about now. I don't think we can take credit for this, though. But there's been an explosion of interest. Uh, by, if I can extract, it's interesting how these thought viruses spread. It takes place over decades, right? Efficient markets started small. Eugene Fama's article in 1969 was <coughs> not that big, but it, it kind of took over. Then it started to falter a little bit, but here behavioral economics is going strong. So I can extrapolate this and we'll cross. 
efficient markets in about 20 years. That's how these things, it's, it's generational. But now, it, it, back in, at this point of time, when it was, when efi efficient markets was growing, it was considered the most wonderful established fact in history and uh, in finance theory. It was, uh, and it was very difficult, because I know, because I tried doing it, criticizing it then. Uh, it's so much easier now. Uh, the world is coming around to, uh, now, uh, I, you mentioned that Eugene Fama won the Nobel Prize with me together. And first of all, I should say I'm a big admirer of Eugene Fama. I think that uh, I trust him, except not completely. <laughs> uh, I, I trust him to come up with interesting research. This is one of his, this is figure one in his Nobel lecture. And what it is, it shows a, an event study that he did on the effect of stock market splits on stock prices. And zero is the date the split was announced. So you can see that stock prices go up rapidly before the split is announced, but afterward, this is excess return over the market. Uh, nothing, nothing. And he said, isn't this a dramatic, and I think he put it as figure one because it shows the power of the efficient markets. The idea, th here's the idea, I don't know if you understand this. Stock Co companies split their shares in response to increases in prices. They don't like, the, in the U.S., they like to have them about $30 a share. So if it goes up to 60, they think, well, it's time for a two to one split. So that's why prices go up before the split. But th well, they don't go up at all after the split, on average. Why is that? Well, because it would be too easy. You could make money. You can't make money out of this part of it. That's the past. Here's the future. You could make money by buying right after a split or, right bef or, or shorting it if there was any pattern at all, but there is no pattern at all. I got to give him credit. This is a stunning uh, piece of evidence for efficient markets. But don't get carried away with it either because this is just splits and this is, these are just months. It's not a long, not a long time. Uh, and now when you think of it, it has to turn out this way. It can't be that you could make a lot of money quickly by just playing a game on splits uh, in a matter of months. It's not going to work so easily. So I think he's right. I, I'm an enthusiastic supporter of efficient markets here. Now, in that sense. Uh, the other thing is that random, uh, what came up at that time was random walk theory. The idea that a stock prices are a random walk and that movements of stock markets, the apparent trendiness of stock prices is an optical illusion. Um, I have here a, the blue line, which is partly covered by the red line, uh, is a simulated random walk. And you can see it appears to have a downtrend here, but there is no trend. It's all random. There's no way to extrapolate a trend. Uh, the red line is an, a first order autoregressive process with the same uh, generating series of random normals. Uh, and it looks fairly similar. The, 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 the public, I, there's no easy way to tell one from the other if the autoregressive coefficient is close to one. Um, but the public fixates on this one because it's simple and elegant. A lot of simple theories tend to drive people's thinking. So um, now I want to come to behavioral economics. We had this huge revolution in behavioral economics. And what it's saying is that things that psychologists tell us are, are relevant. So here are some of the, I, uh, you probably know, any of you who've studied behavioral economics, but uh, these are things that matter for the precipitating <coughs> fact. Framing matters, that's the, not just the <coughs> facts themselves, but the ambiance, the, uh, the things that you see with them. Representativeness heuristic, this is a term from Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, you could read his book, Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, that we tend to form judgments not based on uh, calculations, but on similarities. We, we think of certain major events as salient, and we always wonder, is that coming again? So 1929 is a salient event. For some reason, we never forget a uh, big stock market crash on October 28, 1929. So people are constantly wondering, is today the day when we repeat that? That's not the way we recommend you think, but that's the way people really think. Attention anomalies, people retain their attention uh, to, they, well, there's a social basis for attention. We all pay attention to the same things. So we're operating from a fact set, which is socially determined, and we don't remember certain things that, uh, that 
Uh, the reason we don't remember them is nobody's talking about them lately, and so you just kind of forget them. Regret theory, Loomis and Sugden said that uh, people have pain of regret and do irrational things to try to avoid the possibility of regretting that they did or didn't do something. Envy of others is a powerful human emotion. In the times of rising stock prices, you have a lot of friends who are making a lot of money, you feel bad, you're trying to get rid of that bad feeling. These are emotions that drive human actions. Uh, in an ambiguous situation, the emotions may decide things. Ego involvement, I think, is important. When the stock market goes up, some people make a lot of money, and those people become insufferable. <laughs> they, they, they think they're brilliant, uh, and uh, they end up uh, in a crisis after the market crashes. And that even happened to Sir Isaac Newton, isn't that right? He was uh, the most brilliant physicist of all times, and uh, he, he bought into a boom, and then he decided to get out, and he was really smart if he'd stopped. Then he went back in, <laughs> and then he lost everything. <laughs> uh, even, even people like that, they get involved with the market and uh, lose some of it. So uh, there's been a, I won't go through all of these, but there's been a huge revolution. And it involves as well social so sociology, social psychology, uh, well, and I'm listening. Some of, the, some of these things were known for uh, over a hundred years, but they weren't connected to finance. It, it's something that has happened more recently. So I wanted to talk about precipitating factors. Now I have three sets of precipitating factors. Uh, this is from the first edition of my book in 2000. So I call this the millennium boom. The stock market grew rapidly until January of 2000. Uh, and then the Dow started to peter out. That was the peak. The S&P came out, peaked in March of 2000. Now, I think it's kind of curious that this happened right at the time of the new millennium. I don't, I don't think that's completely a coincidence, because we had this big party, and if you remember it, the whole world was celebrating. It only happens once every thousand years. And there was a lot of talk about uh, the future that's coming, and people were getting excited. It was, it was a party atmosphere. Uh, but things were happening between 1982 and 2000. First of all, the internet appeared, the World Wide Web, in 1994. By 2000, uh, all, all generally savvy people had a connection to the internet. Uh, and it was, it was the future, it created such excitement. Triumphalism is the triumph of capitalism. Remember, in 1991, the Soviet Union came apart. Even before that, communist China started to involve markets. So we were right. It's, it's a great time for efficient, not efficient markets, for the idea that the <coughs> stock market is always going to do well. We developed a business culture. Now some of these are, this, some of these are um, U.S., so I won't uh, go to all the, but um, institutions changed, mutual funds became popular, and gambling became popular. I think the culture changed so that we kind of admired winners rather than flower children and <laughs> beatniks, <laughs> whatever we used to admire. Um, then uh, the next, I call the next thing, the next bubble, which I pointed out to you, that peaked in 2007, the ownership society boom. I didn't know what to name. I think I should, uh, our people are not good at naming booms. They, they name hurricanes, uh, <laughs> but they don't name booms. So I took, tried my, I should have picked uh, women's names or men's names for these. But I thought I'd give them descriptive. So I named this boom between 2003 and 2007, the Ownership Society boom. Now, this is a little bit American sounding, but George W. Bush did an election campaign in 2004 <coughs> in which he stressed the Ownership Society. That the Ownership Society, when people own their own homes, when they own stocks, they're participating in the economy, they will be better citizens. I want you to do that. And he was talking about the home ownership rate going up in the United States. That's great. That's, that's America. This is capitalism. We're all going to be rich, <laughs> sort of, too. So people thought, well, it's great. I should do it. The president wants me to do it. And it can't. <laughs> the Greenspan put was the idea that Alan Greenspan would bail out any market collapse. Uh, and he sounded like he would. So what, what's, to, why, what's not to like about the stock market or the housing market now? Uh, I won't talk, there's some things that were fading, but now the, the, the boom we're going through now, which I call the new normal boom <laughs> in my book, uh, I took that phrase new normal from Bill Gross, who used to be head of PIMCO, 
Uh, I guess he was kicked out uh, for some reason. Uh, but he's still around. And the new normal reflected his idea that the whole world is going into a slow period now with zero interest rates, low demand, uh, and just a disappointing time. Uh, and so I, I thought, well, that's becoming a new thought virus. It's spread, there's a fear all right now of slow growth. Uh, there's another name for it, secular stagnation, which was resurrected from the Great Depression. Secular in Latin means a generation or a century. So when you say secular stagnation, you mean a slow economy at least for one generation and maybe for a century, if I'm taking li the Latin literally. Uh, so uh, now I think that what's driving the boom that we currently have, it looks different. It looks uh, more uh, dark. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, the, the, we have the depression scare uh, is over. Uh, we were really worried about a Great Depression in 19, 2009. Uh, we have extremely loose monetary policy. This is US, QE, quantitative easing one, two, and three. But it's also UK, and now it's the whole Euro European Union stimulus packages that are bringing interest rates down. And then there are other things that I like to emphasize. Uh, and this is uh, really important to me. I think that when historians look back at this time, I'll tell you what they won't care much about. Ukraine. It'll, it, or <laughs> unless something really big develops out of that, that will be a little uh, episode. Uh, Greece. They won't care about That will be completely, totally forgotten. What they will care about is the information revolution. That is big and fundamental. Uh, now, I don't know if you see this, but every time I open up a magazine nowadays, there is an article about robots or there's an article about information technology. My hypothesis is that people are scared about this. They don't know what their future is and they don't know, they're talking about distant future. There was a poll in which uh, the pollster asked, what do, you th uh, do you think it likely that in the next five years you'll lose your job to a computer or a robot? And I have to check this actually, I should have checked it, but I think it was around 30% said, of young people said that, uh, said yes to that. But I don't think that's the right question. The question is, 30 years from now, or your children, what, a, what, what kind of life, are they, what kind of job will they have? And there's so many stories about replacement of jobs. I, by the way, have replaced myself. I have a MOOC. You can take my course if you want. It's <laughs> <laughs> We're starting another series of my course in, uh, in a month or two. There will be a summer school course. And the cost for you is nothing. The cost for me is nothing because it's pre-recorded. <laughs> and I'm just not even, but they're going to try to make it into an experience. You get into chat rooms with each other and they'll arrange meetings for, with other students. This is the way the technology is going. But anyway, I feel replaced uh, because I don't know if I should still do this and just say it again when it's all recorded. Now, I, everyone has a different, we have driverless cars, we have machine translators. This is now, what is it going to be like in 30 years? I'm not telling you anything new, but I think that what it's done is making, making people fearful. Uh, moreover, it draws public attention to income inequality because it's all about income inequality. If you're replaced by a robot, what will you do next? And that's what we don't have an answer to. Uh, so, by the way, this is a worldwide fear. I like, I'm especially interested in worldwide fears because it seems like interest rates are very low around the world. Public attention to income inequality, I think, is partly enhanced by the fact that we have this issue with technology. And there's a theory that the increase in income inequality uh, in advanced and developing countries as well is, has something to do with this new technology. I know it's controversial and not, uh, there was a poll of economists too. Uh, I should look this up, because this, I'm pulling this out of my memory, but the economists, most of them thought that there's a danger to our jobs because of information technology. The, but these aren't the elite economists who write articles about it, who, may not agree with that. Um, but I, I don't care whether it's true or not for this purpose. It's just driving people's actions, this fear. So what it means is you're not going to take that vacation cruise this year. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit anxious. We, we can take it every other year. So we see a slip in demand and people are trying to save more. But it doesn't seem like there are 
investment vehicles to match this increased demand. This is Keynesian economics because, well, the economy is slow and the people don't have business ideas now. So all that happens is people bid up the prices of existing assets and that's where we are. So everything gets pricey uh, and uh, so I think the market is highly priced. So what I have here is a price earnings ratio showing where we're going. Uh, and uh, this is what I call a six. Uh, actually, John Campbell, you were saying, was here on Wednesday. So he is my former student and co author. We defined something called the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio in 1988. This is long ago. Uh, the, th this price earnings ratio is the. Ra uh, I'm almost out of time, aren't I? You have about five minutes. Or five so. minutes, all right. It's the ratio of real stock price to real 10 year average of real earnings. So it's just a smooth denominator. It's just a price earnings ratio that smooths out the business cycle fluctuations in earnings. And you can see that the market got highly priced in 1901, 1929. Uh, forget that, yeah, that's the bond market coming to that. Uh, 2000, uh, there's 2007, that's quite so dramatic. And here we are now uh, at 27. Uh, so right now, we are, uh, the price earnings ratio for the market is at the highest it's been with the exception of 29, 2000, and 2007. Uh, the, the red line is the long term interest rate, the nominal long term interest rate, which I'll come back to. So, John Campbell and I actually presented this at the Federal Reserve Board before Alan Greenspan, the ch chairman, in 1996. And we showed that this is a scatter diagram which has the price earnings ratio on the horizontal axis and the subsequent annualized 10 year return, total return on the vertical axis. Although we didn't have the red line, the red dots came after our, uh, more or less, after our testimony. But there seems to be a, not a strong negative relation, but a negative relation. Well, it's fairly strong. When the price earnings ratio is really low, between 5 and 10, the market does amazingly well after that. When it's really high, let's say above 30, it's, uh, it's just a little bit above zero. So we're right here now. It looks still like a positive return, but maybe something like 3%. Um, so where are we in, in, uh, in the EU? The US is blue here, has a high price, but not, like it, not as high as it's been. Look how high it got. So it's somewhat high. We also have Japan somewhat high, but uh, the EU, the yellow, is not particularly high. So it's not like everywhere is, uh, uh, is overpriced. Uh, this breaks it down by countries. So the red line, now I should have kept the same. I made US, UK, and France red, all red. <laughs> but the US is up here. Uh, we have a very high Cape. It's still high in, it's high, it's like, uh, but not as high as in the US. And here's Greece, Cape ratio of 3.5. Uh, so now I want to move to housing costs. Now, the housing bubble that we had in the US and the UK, everything that happens in the US seems to happen in the UK. I think that's because, or maybe it happens first uh, in the UK, but somehow we have uh, similar cultures. And uh, I'm thinking of culturally determined movements. Uh, but uh, I created a home price index for a, an effort at a constant quality home and corrected for inflation back to 1890. So this is the course of US home prices from 1890 until the present. And what you see is we had a huge boom in the 1990s, peaking in 2006. Similar boom in the UK, or it didn't come down as much. And then we had home prices fall almost in half, huge drop in home prices, and now they're coming back up again. I think the UK is more dramatic. They're, they've they didn't fall as much and they're going up more. But this, this boom in home prices was not related to building costs, not, not exactly, right? Not, no, no real boom in building costs. It wasn't related to population, which is very smooth. And interest rates have been declining for 30 years. It doesn't seem to explain what's happening. So I think there was bubble thinking that was driving this. Same thing happened in Japan at a very different time. So this is Jap Japan residential urban land prices back to the early 70s. They had, it's just amazing how simple this is. The prices of land went up peaked in uh, around 1991, and they've been going down ever since. 
This is not random walk. There's something really irrational. Or it, it can't, this can't be a random walk. It's too smooth, too simple. Um, I should point out, by the way, that the theory of efficient market doesn't work very well at all for housing. Or, uh, because suppose you think it's a bubble. How can you profit from that? You can't short houses. All you can do is stay out of the market. We tried to create a futures market. We did succeed, but not very well. My colleague Chip Case and I created the S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Indices, and then we campaigned to get the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to create a futures market in 10 U.S. cities. Uh, and it's still there. Um, now it's been going for uh, seven years, but it's just low volume. I, we haven't been able to ignite a popular thought virus that you ought to hedge your home on the futures market. I remember I, you, you have betting in in UK on home prices. I called one of your William Hill or one of those places years ago, and I asked, uh, uh, "How are you promoting the use of your betting markets to hedge the risk of loss of single-family homes?" And he said, "What?" <laughs> I said, well, I thought UK homeowners who buy a house should make a bet that the home prices will decline. <laughs> and he said, look, I got to straighten you out here. <laughs> We're a betting market, and it's primarily sports betting, so it's nothing to do with hedging. Why don't people think like that? Well, economists think they ought to, but they don't. Oh, here's uh, uh, the IMF has a world home price uh, series, and uh, you can see London is really zooming. So is Vancouver. I just had an argument with the uh, head of the Bank of Canada. I said, Vancouver looks in trouble to me. Uh, and he said, no, it isn't. They're land constrained. I don't mean to accuse him of naivete, but <laughs> I, I said, maybe they are, but they can still drop. But, um, I was just at the G7 meetings and I met him and it was interesting. Here's feedback in home prices. The question was, uh, now this was given to a questionnaire of home buyers, recent home buyers who just bought a house and they probably have optimistic expectations in the United States. So the question was, I just made the same question and re rephrased it. <laughs> Homes are the best investment for long-term holders who can buy and hold to the ups and downs of the market. And uh, I get a lot of agreement. Of course, they just bought a home. This is cognitive dissonance. Uh, you think it's a good investment because you just made it and you made it big time. It's probably important. But there's similar uh, I have a home price index. You can see somewhat similar that they thought that homes are the best investment when home prices were going up and now they're falling. So it, it, it's the same feedback. Now I want to just say about interest rates and, I'll, and then I'll open this up for questions. The interest rate, I showed it before in uh, red, but now it's the black line here. This is the, this is the long-term interest rate for the United States since 1871. Uh, and you can see it's a very simple pattern. I would say you can memorize this pattern. It's an M shape. It goes up, down, up, down, and that's it. Uh, but this was due to inflation, I think. There was very high, and there was in the UK then too, very high inflation. Uh, so I have here shown the next 10 years inflation rate, and then that's in the dashed line, and, the thin, and then in the thin solid line, I have the preceding 10 years inflation rate. So you can see the ups and downs of the long-term interest rate from, say, 1960 to uh, recently was just matched by inflation. It just stays down just below it. So in other words, but it's lagged inflation, not lead inflation. So what people were doing when the last 10 years had high inflation, they pushed uh, interest rates up, long-term interest rates up. They, they really should have been pushed up in, in accordance with the with the, uh, these are long term, like 10 year rates. They should have moved up and down in accordance with that dash line. So it seems like there was a reaction to inflation driving interest rates. But here is an inflation index bond yield. So uh, I have for four countries UK, Australia, Chile, and the USA. And we can see that there's been a downtrend for 20 years in real interest rates. And look where they are. The latest I have is a negative. This is this is 20-year UK index linked gilts. They were really negative a couple of years ago. US, it's, uh, last time I looked, it's about 0.86 of a percent for 30 years. That red line is a 30-year interest rate. Now, this is just bizarre. People are willing to 
they think this, at some level, they think the stock market is this great investment, but at another level, they want to buy these things even though they promise no return. What the index link guilt is saying, you lend us the money now, and 20 years later, we'll give it back to you, and that's it. <laughs> we won't give you anything more. <laughs> so there's something. Now, the other thing about this chart is I don't see the financial crisis. Well, you see it here right, somewhat, but it seems to be more of a long downtrend. So it comes back to my precipitating factors that I think drive, maybe driving, because it affects all of these countries. I think that we're in an anxious period where we will buy these bonds because they seem safe, uh, and even though they have a low yield. So the other question then is, is this going to end up in a crash? So there's a scenario that some people are floating, that the world bond markets have gotten so high, that means yields are low, that there's going to be a bond market crash, and this is going to drive the next big financial crisis. So I wanted to look at bond market crashes. So I got a total return index for, Mood, for Moody's long-term corporate bonds. And what this is, is what you would have, if you had invested one dollar, I guess, in the United States in corporate bonds in 1857 and kept reinvesting them until today, that's what you're, you, would be, you would have over a thousand dollars. But I'm, I, I don't know if that's not a huge return, but it's a very stable return. When I look at it, the, this is the only crisis right here. So in the, at maximum, the bond market, nominal bond market, lost 12.6% of its value in one year in 1982. After having done this, I decided not to predict in my third edition that there's going to be a bond market crash and an associated stock market and housing crash. Because the bond market seems to be, uh, it's been low for the better part of a decade now. Uh, I don't know that it has shown a tendency to change fast. So let me just conclude. This is my last slide. Um, I, I, I've stuck with the title of my book, Irrational Exuberance. Uh, so the third edition is talking about bubbles of sort, but different kind of bubbles that don't have the same exuberance. Um, so. Uh, I think, though, I can still call it irrational exuberance because it reflects human nature it, to be exuberant about the latest theory, the latest idea. Uh, and the still, the basic model that precipitating factors drive things and then feedback reinforces them is uh, still at work. But it's not so classical a bubble right now as, as usual. Although in places it is. I think in London, your property is a bubble, but maybe it's Russians. Uh, and Arabs who are psychologically involved, not present company. Um, so anyway, I think that we still have a sort of bubble, and there is a sort of uh, enthusiasm, ir irrational exuberance. But I liken it to an LSD high rather than an ecstasy high. <laughs> now, I have never taken either of these drugs, <laughs> but I understand that um, I am told if you are feeling suicidal, and anxious, don't take LSD. It can make it worse. <laughs> it's sort of an edgy high. You should take ecstasy <laughs> instead, <laughs> because everybody has a good experience, I'm told, on <laughs> ecstasy. <laughs> That's my closing <laughs> advice. Uh, excellent. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Uh, that was wonderful. So what we'll do is we'll move on to the question part uh, of the evening, and um, I will open the floor. And in particular, please wait for the steward to come around with the roving microphones. And what I'd like to do is to collect uh, a couple of questions uh, so we can make it perhaps more efficient. And uh, before you begin your, uh, your quick question, uh, please let us know your name and affiliation, if you would. All right, so I think you were the first with your hand up. Let's get a question from you, and then we'll have a question from you. Good evening. Uh, Professor Schiller, thank you really for the inspirational talk. Um, I'm Diego Navarra, the founder and director of Studio Navarra, which is uh, a part of a pro bono initiative of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I'd like to just point out a couple of issues that I feel are perhaps of interest in, a, 
in, in connection with your talk tonight. Now, you've mentioned land, mm -hmm. and you've mentioned efficiency. Um, and what we have seen in the irrational exuberance of market you have well predicted, it's precisely that these markets are unpredictable, perhaps, but is there a sense that as we try to converge towards climatic aspects and their influences um, in the behavior of companies, that there will be a new exuberance towards natural resources, for instance, in addition to those markets you, um, and everyone here at LSE, I guess, is very well familiar with. Um, I the reason why I'm saying this is because we evangelize um, with a group of uh, um, highly motivated individuals uh, around an initiative called Climate Exchange. Uh, and this initiative uh, precisely aims to foster a better understanding of these issues and the way in which it affects not just current markets, but future markets as well. Um, so I'd, I'd like to perhaps ask you what your thoughts are on this, and thank you. Great, so there's one question. Let's um, grab one more, and then we'll have Professor Schiller respond. Okay. Professor Schiller, I, I'm Nicholas right. Beale. Oh, sorry. Right there. I, I'm Nicholas Beale from SciTeb. Do you think that the increasing globalization and the, the big impact that China in particular has on the world means that comparing U.S. stock market with U.S. GDP is increasingly problematic. Comparing the stock market to GDP? Yeah. Because, for example, Apple, famously now the most valuable company in the world, and it makes an awful lot of its money outside the United States and indeed does an awful lot of its production outside of the United States. Okay. All right. Well, the first question was about uh, land and... Uh, uh, Climate and uh, re <laughs> let me say there's a land bubble going on too. I didn't show land prices, but in the U.S., mm -hmm. farm prices. Uh, I, I haven't updated in the extreme late. We have a big bo boom in farmland. I understand U.K. farmland as well. Mm. At least I'm out of I'm out of date on that. Uh, but you know the funny thing is nobody talks about farmland. Mm. Uh, uh, so it's, it hasn't developed the story potential. So yeah, I've asked people from the UK, what's farmland doing? They never seem to know. <laughs> I've read that it has sold at good prices. Uh, I just spent the night on a farm the other night here. And the, it's, it seemed like a lively business to me. And if, uh, <laughs> if land is, uh, if, if, uh, if the climate is changing, it, it might be really uh, important. Now, it, it, this brings to mind the, um, the great population scare of the 1970s and the boom in agricultural land then. Uh, I know U.S. data, but the Club of Rome came out with a study called Limits to Growth in the 1970s. And uh, it involved Jay Forrester, who is an MIT electrical engineering professor who's widely admired. He was dabbling in economics, but it looked very authoritative, and they were predicting that because of rapid population growth, we would soon run out of food and people would be starving massively. So right at that time, we saw a land boom in the United States. And pr land prices soared just like home prices have done recently, and then they collapsed. So you know, it's while it lasts, while there's uh, enthusiasm. Uh, so I, it, now it seems to me that it could happen again now with global warming, mm -hmm. our failure to control that, uh, and uh, but it depends on the story. The, the thing is that it's the story that drives things. You talk to a newspaper reporter, maybe talk to one, tell them, I think there's a big story here that land prices might soar because the climate change is going to make a scarcity of food. Uh, what the reaction that a reporter will probably give you is, can I sell this story? <laughs> I don't know. I just don't think it's a winner. That's how... I, uh, I write a column for the New York Times, and I, I've gotten a little bit accustomed to knowing you want to be on the most popular list of the columns. <laughs> you d it's a, there's a time for everything, and uh, there may be a time when that story resonates, and then we'll see another land boom. But I, I just don't know how to judge it. Uh, so the other thing about globalization, um, yeah, th there, is a, there is a startling change in our world culture 
that many of us work for global institutions. Well, like the LSD is a global <laughs> institution, by the way. What percent of your students are from the UK? Do you I don't know that number. I send all kinds of students over here yeah. <laughs> from yeah. USA. I think we're the most global uh, institution in the world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> David Webb is back there. He might know. But, <laughs> uh, but you have, in your name, you have London, yes. which gives you a certain cachet, which is respected all over the world. Mm -hmm. That's a story. <laughs> so uh, that's how marketing proceeds. So uh, anyway, you were asking about, I'm not sure what exactly, uh, th 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 maybe you were discussing uh, Warren Buffett's uh, earnings to GDP ratio. Because he says Warren Buffett has been issuing concerns about an overpriced stock market lately. And his favorite ratio is the share of corporate earnings in GDP. And he claims, well, it is. I looked it up. It is high uh, by standards of recent decades. Um, and uh, right after World War II, I think it was higher, but not much higher. That was temporary. Mm -hmm. So he thinks that it's unsustainable. For all courts of, incidentally, the value of the stock market is affected by politics and popular culture, even directly. Because right now, there's all this concern about uh, inequality. And if you look at presidential candidates in the United States, both Republicans and Democrats have something to say about mm -hmm. how they're going to deal with inequality. So it's a big issue. It may end up taxing corporations. It, that's that's uh, a fear. Uh, so that's why Warren Buffett thinks that uh, the stock market is over. That's another ratio suggesting it's overpriced. But then if you put it in an international context, we have all these multinational companies. They're not tied particularly to one country's GDP. Uh, there's another problem that these international companies uh, pose is that already in this previous financial crisis, we saw international companies had to be bailed out. Like Royal Bank of Scotland, I think of that as one of my there's a big RBS building right near my house <laughs> in Connecticut. But they were bailed out by the UK government, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think the US had to contribute to that. But as this becomes more and more entrenched, it's going to be harder to deal with international financial crises. OK. So let's see. Uh, there's a question there. And uh, then, I don't know, I'm trying to balance the room. Uh, the lady in the middle? We could have her on deck. That's yeah, that, that gentleman. Um, I'm John Drummond. I work for a spread betting company. Um, Spare bank? Spread betting. Spread oh, betting. I'm sorry. Spread betting. <laughs> oh, you are one of the spread betters. Uh, I work for them. I don't you work know. for them. <laughs> um, I suppose my uh, query is, is, how do you think the rise in algorithmic trading on exchanges will impact your feedback mechanisms? In to, given to some extent it's going to distance or at least change the way the human emotion uh, works with it. Okay, and then did she get the mic? Yes. Hi, my name's Lisa, and I work in finance. Um, a lot of traders rely heavily on technical analysis. What's your view on that? Okay. Uh, so uh, you asked about algorithmic trading. That's having a computer do trading. They're especially important for high-frequency trading. Uh, Longer-frequency trading, I think, seems to be more uh, a judgment about what Parliament is going to do or what, who's going to win the next election, uh, which I don't think we can entrust to computers so well at this point. Uh, I recommend a book by uh, Levy and Murnane called The New Division of Labor. They talk in that book about what kind of occupations in the United States where they're dated, but I, I assume it applies more generally. What kind of occupations are easily replaced by computers and maybe done better by computers? And they, they, uh, they, they said that occupations that are less equally easily replaced are occupations that involve expert knowledge and complex communication skills. So what does that mean? Ex this is a really important book, I think, for young people who are deciding on their careers. Expert knowledge means general adaptable knowledge. It's not what you get from Wikipedia. It's an ability to bring to bear on a problem, on a, on a unforeseen, unstandard problem, uh, a wide range of uh, understanding of, <coughs> of, of science. And secondly, complex communication is the ability to be persuasive. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and to do it right. In other words, to tell someone what you ought to be doing, which is something that a Wikipedia doesn't tell you that. It, no. So at this point in history, that kind of skill is rewarded. And I think that algorithmic training, or people who set up neural network programs to discover patterns, they're inevitably looking at short-term day-to-day fluctuations. And I think trying to be a day trader is probably getting increasingly hard because of computers. But I think there's this other side of longer-term investing that's still so heavily judgment, it's judgment, human judgment-based. And I think that that's a good field to be, I think finance is a good major for people who are worried about being uh, replaced by a computer. <laughs> but I'm thinking it wouldn't be algorithmic trading. It would be the more uh, human side of uh, finance with some quantitative skills mm -hmm. uh, and ability to solve problems uh, that, that will last. Now, you asked uh, my opinion of technical analysis. Uh, the word, I don't think you hear it so much as much. Technical analysis refers to a approach to investing of half a century to a century ago. Mm. Uh, it was, it was uh, the chartists. They, they didn't have computers. They had spreadsheets, old-fashioned spreadsheets, and they would plot stock prices, and they would draw lines and representing trends and the like. Uh, Burton Malkiel, in that book, Random Walks Down Wall Street, <coughs> savagely attacks them and says they have no knowledge, nothing. Uh, but he d uh, I was a little bit put off because he doesn't, in his book, cite studies mm -hmm. that show that technical analysis is completely wrong. So I asked him once, I met him at a cocktail party, and I said, how do you know that technical analysis doesn't work? And he didn't give me a great answer, I thought. <laughs> uh, so then we have now behavioral economists who are finding that there's some element of truth to technical analysis. Uh, but it, they, they tend to approach it with more of a research uh, orientation. Um, OK, great. Uh, so our time is up, unfortunately. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure to listen to uh, Professor Schiller. Thank you so much for your visit. As I mentioned, outside there'll be a book signing and sales. Let's give one last round of applause to Professor Schiller. <laughs>